Are you prepared for an adventure? We're about to enter the most promising ground in the Bible. We're going to enter a section of Scripture that is the only section of Scripture that has the audacity to promise a special blessing to the participant, to the listener, to the reader of this section of Scripture. It's amazing that no other book of the Bible does this. All through the Bible, there are admonitions to study the Bible. Psalm 119, the longest psalm in the Bible, every verse is basically a call into uh, the Word of God in a broad sense. And there's all kinds of passages having to do with the, the Torah or the prophets and so forth. And most of these, by connotation, are used connotatively, uh, broadly. But there's only one book in the Bible that says, read me, I'm special. And that's, interestingly enough, it's the book that's probably read the least. Especially by the good, sound, basic, fundamental Christian believer. And so we're going to enter into a very, very special portion of God's Word. And to set an example, something that you and I really should never do, we should never enter into the Word of God, but by prayer. So let's bow our hearts right now for a word of prayer. Father, we just praise you for your Son, Jesus Christ. And we also praise you, Father, for his unveiling as it occurs in this portion of your word. And Father, we would ask you right now to bind the forces of darkness, that you would just reveal to us through your Holy Spirit those truths, those insights, those revelations about him that are here and contained. For we come before you, Father, claiming the promise that where two or three are gathered together, whatsoever they'd ask you to do. We ask, Father, that you just show us what you would have here for us this day. In Jesus' name, name. Amen. We're going to take on a very, very exciting study. And because we are, I'd like to take the time to really set some fundamentals. Many of you in this audience may be with us the first time. And um, so I'm going to sort of ask the regulars to indulge a few basics that we have talked about before, but that certainly apply to this book. Now, the first thing I'd like to highlight is the name of the book. It's amazing how you go through groups and how often people speak of the book of Revelations, plural. And when they say that, it's an immediate telegraph that they have never studied it, or at least they certainly have never read the first verse. Because, yes, it's a collection of visions and symbols and things, but it is the revelation singular, not about the future, not about Fill in a lot of different blanks. It's the revelation of what? The revelation of Jesus Christ. Now, the word in the Greek is apocalypse, apocalypsis, and uh, the word means unveiling. The model that you might have in your mind is a statue that's been veiled, hidden by the artist until he's really ready. We've all seen those kinds of things, whether it's a painting or a sculpture. And then at the proper time, it's unveiled. And that's the intent of the word. We're going to see here the unveiling of Jesus Christ. We've studied Jesus Christ in the Old Testament in anticipation of the New. We've studied Jesus Christ in the New Testament, the suffering servant that came not for a manger but for a cross. But what the book of Revelation is going to deal with is Jesus Christ today. Today and what he's doing, and what he's about to do. Now, I've emphasized something. I want us to really have an atmosphere of expectation. God himself has provided a commitment to each of us that this is going to be a very special blessing. One of the questions that should be in our mind, why? What makes this book so special? Well, obviously, one safe answer to that is certainly by the Holy Spirit. Because it isn't just the words, it's the ministry of the Holy Spirit that will be operative here. But there are many reasons, as I've tried to analyze this book, having studied it really for a better part of 40 years. 
One of the reasons, not the only reason, but one of the reasons this book is such a blessing, it's a lens through which the entire Bible comes into focus. And I'll show you some reasons why that happens. Another reason is that the focus of that lens is clearly on the person of Jesus Christ. Probably no other book in the scripture. So clearly, so unequivocally, so completely focuses on the person of Jesus Christ. Another thing that comes through the book, of course, is a concept of eminence. That Jesus has a destiny, that his undertaking that destiny is eminent. It can begin at any moment. Now, we have a group here, a very large audience, and many of you come from many different fellowships. So I guess the other commitment I should give you, I think we'll have something here to offend everyone. Okay. We're non-denominational, but very biblically fundamental. And uh, I mention that because uh, we uh, uh, really come at this untrammeled with any other commitments other than to try to search out the Word of God and try to understand uh, what God is saying here. We do believe that God means what he says and says what he means. And uh, this book is an exciting book because, first of all, it's a book of victory. It's a book that heralds the fact that we are going to overcome. What this book lays out is that you and I, if we understand and do what this book says, will be winners in the game of life. When I was in college, I quickly learned that the answers to any textbook are in the back, right? Well, as you study your Bible, if you get confused, where are the answers? In the back. And by the way, the last book in the Bible is not the concordance. It's, 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 it's the Bible. Okay. All right. Now, one of the reasons this book is so puzzling, because I, I think we should be honest with ourselves, many, many people are confused by this book. And there's all kinds of uh, viewpoints. And yet, uh, Peter tells us in 1 Peter uh, one twenty, he says that no prophecy of the scriptures is any private interpretation. In other words, there is a specific intended meaning that God intends. And our, our task is to discover what that is. I am going to suggest that with the right approach, there's no reason this book needs to be confusing. That's quite a challenge. And uh, uh, we'll, we'll deal with that. One of the reasons this book strikes us as strange is due to our lack of grasp of the Old Testament. The book of Revelation has 404 verses. And in those 404 verses, there are virtually 800 allusions from the Old Testament. In other words, almost twice as many as our verses. And so, one of the reasons it seems so strange is because we haven't done our homework. The more you know about the Old Testament, the Bible in general, the Old Testament in particular, the more the idioms of this book will become comfortable to you. And so that's one of our challenges. I also want to highlight the relevance of this book. I'm going to just make the statement that only the biblically illiterate are unable to perceive that we're moving quickly into the last days. I'm going to suggest that you and I are being propelled into a period of time about which the Bible in general, in Revelation in particular, says more than it does about any other period of time in human history, including the time that Jesus walked the shores of Galilee and climbed the mountains of Judea. If you pick up any commentary in the book of Revelation, they'll generally tell you there are four classic viewpoints about this book. One is called the preterist viewpoint, and that's a viewpoint by some scholars that John was writing strictly for application during that era. The persecutions of Nero and Domitian and so forth. And uh, if that's true, then it has no relevance to the future. It was written just for that time. And for lots of you really have to go through some contortions to support that kind of view. I don't believe it's very widely held by most people who take the Bible seriously today. There is a similar kind of view, an extension of that in a sense, called the historicist view, which believes that, that uh, Revelation basically has been fulfilled in past history. And there, to, there also you'll find all kinds of contortions indulged in to try to make it fit that. I'll just leave that to those that want to play those games. Perhaps the most widespread view is the allegorical or symbolic view. To really understand this, it's worthwhile having at least some grasp of church history. In the early centuries, in the time of the book of Acts and subsequent for more than 100 years, 
the early church fathers took the Bible literally. That's well documented. They took it very seriously. They operated with a feeling of eminence that Jesus would come back at any time. Now, it wasn't until Oregon who started to allegorize. when there, it, this all, it really started to change about the 4th century. When Constantine adopted Christianity as his religion and favored it at court, and it was a successor of his that actually enforced it as a formal religion of the Roman Empire. When that all started, of course, it was very awkward for the Roman leadership to adopt a religious view that argued that Jesus Christ is going to come back and rule the world, wrest the world away from its evil conquerors and run it properly. That was not very popular to the Roman leadership. <laughs> and so... Oregon, among others, and then Augustine subsequently started to allegorize these passages, not just Revelation, but that was certainly one of the major ones, that these things were really spiritual, not literal. And those ideas really emerge in the fourth century onwards. And they become the formal doctrine of the Catholic Church. One of the issues that will emerge, of course, is this whole idea of the millennium. Because the Old Testament teaches and the New Testament reinforces the idea that Jesus Christ is destined to take the throne of David and to literally rule the planet Earth as a political ruler. That when Gabriel announced the Messiah, his birth to Mary in Luke chapter 1, he makes that point to her, that her child will sit on the throne of David. So this whole issue of a literal throne, and you need to understand Jesus today is where? Is he on the throne of David? No, he's on his father's throne. And I'll come back to some of these issues as we go. But the point is, this concept of a literal millennium was, of course, held by the Jewish community in the Old Testament. It was held by the early Christians the first few centuries. But it starts to get analyzed away, if you will, by applying a symbolic and allegorical meanings to many passages. And that doctrine becomes the doctrine of the Roman Catholic Church. When the Reformation occurs... The Reformers addressed aggressively doctrines of salvation, salvation by faith and not by works. And all those issues that became the great banners of the Reformation were, of course, uh, well dealt with. But it's interesting that the Reformers didn't really deal with the eschatology. So even the Protestant, the mainline denominations after the Reformation still were heir to the eschatology of the Catholic Church, which looked upon this idea of a millennium, as they call it, because this thousand-year reign of Jesus Christ, as something spiritual, something symbolic. And those kinds of ideas, if you try to apply them in the book of Revelation, start to create some real problems, not the least of which is that you can spiritualize these symbols to mean anything you want if you uh, apply those kinds of hermeneutics, principles of interpretation. Now, it's interesting, uh, and I'll, I'll deal with this, sometimes called the idealist school or the allegorical school. It goes by different names. It's probably the most prevalent view by many books that you'll pick up on Revelation. If you take the Bible seriously, if you really take it as the Word of God, and if you really have a, a more literal perspective of it, uh, you come up to a different view altogether, the fourth view, and that's the view that we'll primarily lean on. It's sometimes called the futurist view, or the prophetic view, is that the book of Revelation is what it claims to be, a book of prophecy. We're going to find out that it claims to be a book of prophecy all throughout the book. I won't give you a whole list of verses. They'll be in the notes. We're going to take the book literally. There are places where the book indeed deals with idioms, visual symbols, what's called in linguistic semimes. I want you to notice something when you study your Bible. And that is, is that uh, when someone in the Bible is reading the Bible, he takes it literally. When Daniel in chapter 9 is reading the book of Jeremiah and sees there that 70 years captivity was prophesied, he's in the captivity, about 60 some odd years have gone by, he knows it's about over. In other words, he's reading it literally. And uh, the main preoccupation that uh, we have, I'll really describe it just as a discovery that in my own life uh, came many years ago, was the discovery that these 66 books we call the Bible were penned by 40 authors over thousands of years and yet are an integrated message system. I'm going to take the position that every number, every place name, every detail of the original text is there by supernatural engineering. And there are thousands of examples to demonstrate that, and I'll spare you that this evening. I'll just assert it as a position I'm taking, hoping you will challenge that in your own studies and uh, uh, determine those things for yourself. 
One of the things you're going to discover as we get into the book of Revelation is you're going to discover that virtually every page of the Old Testament anticipates the book of Revelation. I'll exaggerate only a little bit, but I really believe that you can't find anything in the scripture that doesn't have a direct impact on your understanding of the book of Revelation. Now, that's a two-edged sword in a sense, because on the one hand, that's one of the reasons the book of Revelation is such an incredible blessing to the student, is because it'll take you through an understanding of the whole Bible. And conversely, as you read your Bible, and uh, you'll get a perspective of the climax, which, of course, is the book of Revelation. So it's a reflexive issue. Now, I can remember many, many years ago, I first got interested in this book because I heard a lecturer point out that the book of Revelation is in code. Well, that's no surprise. I think we've all sort of sensed that. <laughs> But they point out that every one of those codes is explained somewhere else in Scripture. So what you and I are going to do is we're going to go on a treasure hunt. And you have the main tool, the main commentary you need right in your laps. If you don't have one, I encourage you to get an exhaustive concordance. Now, the concordance in the back of your Bible, in my opinion, is not that useful. I'm going to encourage you to find out what an exhaustive concordance is. There's several of them around, a Strong's, a Young's, a Cruden, you can, any good... Christian bookstore will have these, and they're not expensive. Uh, Most people, I think, are drawn to the Strong's Concordance. It's somewhat emerging as a standard. If for no other reason than so many other books that are helpful, key to the unusual numbers in Strong's. Strong's has a numbering system for all the Hebrew words and all the Greek words, so you don't have to know Hebrew or Greek to be able to unravel what words mean. But perhaps its most useful attribute is that Concordance, an exhaustive Concordance, can tell you where any word appears in the Bible. You can look up the word, pick any word, like the word millstone. It'll show you all the places it appears. That allows you to find allusions. If you're wondering, if you, for some reason, well, let's say, take a better example, let's say hems, hems of garments. Well, you can look up hems and discover that there's an interesting insight between the hems of Saul's garment that David cut off versus the hems that, um, are, uh, that the woman touched the hem in the New Testament. You'll discover that there is a conception behind hems that will only come to you if you look at all the places that word appears. And as you start using a concordance, you'll discover that these 66 books use these terms consistently, despite the fact that they've been assembled by 40 authors over thousands of years. You begin to see the fingerprints of the Holy Spirit all over this thing. And that's one of the most powerful tools in studying the book of Revelation, because we'll encounter phrases, idioms, images, that are virtually all of them. There's a few probably that still puzzle us, but most of them you'll find are nothing more than allusions from some other portion of Scripture. As you start to do that, you'll discover, uh, quite visibly, that the whole thing is designed. Now, one of the things that a lot of people are very apologetic about, and I want to get this out of the way right away, that's the study of prophecy. Well, you're a prophecy nut. I make no apology for that, because I'm going to argue that most of the Bible is prophecy. Now, when you say prophecy, most of us mean, well, foretelling the future. That's not what prophecy is all about. Prophecy is really seeing God's whole plan in perspective. To give you an example of what I want to get at, turn with me. Let's just start off by taking a look at Luke chapter 24. An event occurs in Luke 24, I think, that is very revealing. Luke 24 deals with that first Sunday when the tomb was discovered to be empty. Around the Easter season, of course, we always read the events of that morning. The various people discovering the tomb was empty, that Jesus is risen, and we're all familiar with most of those passages. But I want to focus for the moment on what occurred that afternoon. And we'll pick up chapter, Luke chapter 24, about verse 13, and just examine a rather unusual, I think, kind of humorous incident that occurred. Speaking of two disciples, as behold, two of them went the same way, the same day, to a village called Emmaus, which was from Jerusalem about three score furlongs, or approximately seven miles. So these two guys are walking to Emmaus. And they talked together of all those things that had happened. And it came to pass that while they communed together and reasoned, Jesus himself drew near and went with them. But their eyes were holding that they should not recognize him. For some reason, unexplained, they didn't realize who he was. Verse 17, he, that's Jesus, says to them, What manner of communications are these that ye have with one another as ye walk and are sad? And one of them, his name was Cleopas, answering, said unto him, Art thou only a stranger in Jerusalem? And hast thou not known the things which are come to pass here in these days? 
I love this. Jesus says, what things? I want you to sense the humor here. These two guys are walking. They're very disturbed. They're very blue. They're really down. A stranger joins them, as far as they can tell. And he says, what's the matter, guys? Why are you down? And they sort of look at him and say, where have you been, fella? In effect, you know. Jesus, a few days ago, he was arrested at night, put through six trials, segments of trials, whatever you want to call them, and then um, brutally beaten, crucified, buried, dead. Three days later, raises from the dead, right? And he says, what things? <laughs> I really wonder if he could pull that off without a smile on his face. I mean, that's, it gets worse. Hang on. And, of course, they answered him concerning Jesus of Nazareth, who was a prophet, mighty indeed, in word before God and all the people, and how the chief priests and our rulers delivered him to be condemned to death and have crucified him. And we were hoping that it had been he that would have uh, redeemed Israel. And besides all this, today is the third day since these things were done. Yea, and certain women also of our company amazed us, who were early at the sepulcher. And when they found not his body, they came, saying that they had also seen a vision of angels, who said that he was alive. And certain of those who were with us went to the sepulcher and found it even as they had said. But him they found not. Now, if you and I were writing the shooting script for this scene, you know, you would find it hard to resist him not calling down maybe a flash of lightning, something, an earthquake, and say, hey, guys, it's me. I mean, wake up, guys. Don't you realize who I am? That's not what he does. In fact, he even talks about himself in the third person. Christ, that guy. Notice what he says in verse 25. Then he said to them, Oh, foolish ones and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Ought not Christ to have suffered these things and enter into his glory. He's counseling them as if Christ is some other guy. But I want you to notice something here. He says, O foolish one, slow of heart, to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Every detail of his life, and especially the last few days, are laid out in detail in the Old Testament. You'll even find physical descriptions in there that you won't find in the New Testament, but that's a study for another time. But 27 is the verse I want you to look at carefully. Notice what Jesus does. This is his first ministerial act after his resurrection. What does he do? Verse 27. And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded unto them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. That's quite a verse when you think it through. First of all, it's interesting that he presents himself not by some miracle or something, by just getting them to do their homework, to read Moses and all the prophets. He expounded them in all the scriptures, all the scriptures, Psalms, Proverbs, all the scriptures. When he says scriptures, he's obviously talking about the Old Testament. It fascinates me, by the way, I often ask groups, what Bible study was given by seven different people on 12 different occasions always had dramatic results, and is never given today. What Bible study is given by seven different people on twelve different occasions, and is never given today? And this all occurs in one book of the Bible. In the book of Acts, Paul, Philip, Peter, you can list seven of them, always present Jesus Christ from the Scriptures. What Scriptures were available in the book of Acts? The Old Testament. Seven different people on twelve different occasions present Jesus Christ entirely from the Old Testament, and it always resulted in dramatic results. I won't ask for a show of hands, but in your own mind's eye, how many of you could present to your Jewish friend Jesus Christ using only the Old Testament? Not many, I suspect, if I really asked. The reason is we haven't done our homework. I leave that as a challenge. Anyway, that's what he does. He does it twice. He does it here and he does it with his disciples. So when you take the seven people, they become eight. And they don't become twelve times. It keeps fourteen. So the eight is the number of new beginnings. Seven is a twice. Yeah, you, you can play with that if you like numbers. Anyway, move on. And I love the way this ends. They drew near unto the village to which they went. And he made as though he would have gone further. But they constrained him, saying, Abide with us, for it is toward evening. And the day is far spent. And he went in to tarry with them. And it came to pass, as he sat eating with them, he took bread and blessed it, broke it, and gave it to them. That's unusual. He was the guest. It's the host's job to break the bread. And, of course, immediately, verse 31, their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, and he vanished out of their sight. 
because he had a date in Jerusalem, seven miles away, a little later. Now, they recognized him when he broke the bread. The conjecture we all have is that they recognized him because of the nail prints. In fact, that's even highlighted later on when they're in the upper room. Because in verse 35, verse 33, they're, they're up in the upper room, they return to Jerusalem. And they get, these two guys were part of the inner circle, not the, not the eleven, but they were part of the inner circle. And they're all there. And he said, saying, the Lord is risen indeed and hath appeared to Simon, verse 35. And they told what things were done along the way and how he was known to them in the breaking of the bread. See, the bread was the key somehow. Now, verse 32, we can't miss that. That's the reaction to the seven-mile Bible study they had. And they said to one another, did not our heart burn within us while he talked with us along the way and while he opened to us the scriptures? Now, there's many lessons from this passage in Luke. Uh, but the main thought I want to give you is that I make no apologies for having an inordinate interest in prophecy. Because that's what most of the Bible is about. Jesus said in Psalm 40, verse 8, the volume of the book is written of me. Uh, again, I wanted to find prophecy as God's entire plan and perspective. There are 1,845 references to Christ's rule on the earth in the Old Testament. In other words, the second coming. That's a lot. A total of 17 Old Testament books give prominence to that event. Of 216 chapters in the New Testament, there are 318 references to the Second Coming. It is mentioned in 23 of the 27 books of the New Testament. There are three that are just single chapter letters to private individuals, and then the book of Galatians focuses on something different. For every prophecy in the Bible of his first coming, there seems to be about eight of a second coming. So if his first coming is important, and I assume it is, (laughs) I'm going to suggest there's eight times the references to his second coming. So I don't think any of us need to be sensitive about uh, being interested in in prophecy. Now, one of the things that I'm going to argue, the way to keep yourself out of trouble, because it's very easy to get hung up on some detail and at the expense of everything else. Whenever you find an issue that seems to be controversial, that seems to be a point of disagreement, always test it by the whole counsel of God. Most scholars who talk about uh, hermeneutics, interpreting the Bible, point out that context is important. That's very true, but unfortunately inadequate. You have to take as context, ultimately, the total context, the 66 books. So you want to test any theory, any view, any perspective is how it fits the rest of the Bible. It means if you get into a controversial area, you may have views, but hold those views with a certain openness as you learn and mature. We all need to do that. And of course, Jesus challenges you continually. Search the Scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life. And they are they which testify of me, John 5, 39. Testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. We'll find that in Revelation 19 when we get there. By the way, what we're going to see in the book of Revelation, frankly, is a fulfillment of your prayers. How many of you prayed the Lord's Prayer? See, that's about 50%. That's pretty good. <laughs> Did you pray, Thy kingdom come? See, many people pray that. have no idea what they're praying. It seems like a good idea. It's there. Every, Thy kingdom come. What you know, that's what's happening here. That's what the book of Revelation is going to bring up. The book of Acts covers about 30 years of the church, roughly. Church has gone on for almost 2,000. You're going to discover, amazingly enough, Revelation picks up where Acts finishes and covers that period of time, among other things. And by the way, of the book of Revelation, the two chapters that will prove to be the most significant to most people that read the book are are the ones that are usually ignored. That's chapters 2 and 3. I could argue in a denotative sense that the only chapters that really apply to you in a a practical sense are chapters 2 and 3. I'll show you why when we get to chapter 4. And by the way, the key idea in the book of Revelation is redemption, not salvation. You know, we go through the New Testament, we get through the epistles, all this, and it's very salvation intensive for good reasons. The book of Revelation deals with redemption. This concept of redemption is an interesting one. Uh, I'm going to suggest to you that there are two great acts of the Eternal Father. One was the creation, and the other is the redemption. Those are two big deals, two major milestones in God's calendar. I'm going to suggest to you that the redemption is vastly more important than the creation itself. 
Now, why do I say that? Well, how do you measure importance? Well, one way to measure importance in the scripture is how much space is devoted to it. The creation has, well, a couple of chapters in the book of Genesis, right? We have uh, a few Psalms, right? A few chapters in the book of Job. A few chapters in the book of Isaiah. And pretty much that's about it. Well, let's take a look at the book of redemption. I mean, the concept of redemption. Well, that's what the book of Genesis is mostly about. Certainly the book of Exodus, the redemption of Israel. The book of Leviticus, most of the Torah. The book of Joshua, the conquest of the land, basically is an issue of redemption. Book of Ruth, the, ma- the basic model. If you don't understand the book of Ruth, you won't understand Revelation 5. It's a prerequisite to Revelation 5. The prophets, the major and minor prophets. Redemption is a m- major preoccupation. And you get to the New Testament, certainly the Gospels, that's what they're all about, the epistles. And, of course, climax of the book of Revelation. But there's another way to measure importance. What did it cost? What did it cost God to create the universe? I get the impression from the scripture that he just called it into existence. You know, he spent, what, six days? Huh? What did your, yours and my redemption cost him? His son. So I want us to be sensitive. Redemption is the restoration to that which was lost to the original owner. And we could go through a lot on that, but I I, will have plenty of time to go further. Now, I mentioned that one reason the scripture, the the book of Revelation is so difficult to to, uh, a new believer, especially, or someone that doesn't really know their Bible, is that it relies on what seems to be about 800 illusions. The 404 verses deal with about 800 illusions. We have over 100 references in the Torah. That will be touched. That, that that are implied by the passages we're going to go through. There's uh, several dozen, three or four or five dozen of uh, in the historical books. And there's probably a hundred allusions in the uh, poetical books. There's over 300 allusions directly out of the major prophets. About a hundred out of the minor prophets, as they're called. So you've got about over 600 direct references, and we'll have lists of all of these with the notes that accompany the tapes. Also, in addition to those direct references, there are also allusions in in a broader sense. Now, one of the things I want to get at before we really get into the book, you know, we'll talk a little bit about a methodology. One of the things I'd like to talk about is that uh, in John 16, 13, in fact, let's just take, let's, to, to emphasize, turn to John 16. We're talking about the special discourse in John 14 through 17. In John 16, he's, it's his last intimate conversation with his disciples. Starting about verse 12, he says, I have yet many things to say unto you, but you cannot bear them now. Nevertheless, when he, the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of truth, who's that? Holy Spirit. When he has come, he will guide you into all truth, for he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he hear, he, he shall speak, and he will show you things to come. In another place, Jesus says that he will teach you all things. So the first thing I want you to keep in prayer as you study this book, is to keep in focus who is your teacher. And it ain't Chuck Missler. In fact, what I want you to do in your notes, those of you that have come prepared to take notes, I want you very conspicuously in your notes to put Acts 17.11. Acts chapter 17, verse 11. That's where Luke admonishes you not to believe anything Chuck Missler tells you. On the one hand, we're going to go through a lot of material, and I'll try to give some background. But I think anything of substance, I want you to treat great skepticism. Acts 17.11 deals with the Bereans. Paul just come from Thessalonica. When he got to the Bereans, it speaks of them and says, They were more noble than those in Thessalonica, in that they received the word of God with all readiness of mind, but... Search the scriptures daily to prove whether those things were so. In other words, they were open, they received, but then they checked it out. The Bereans were from Missouri, so to speak. Okay? And so I want you to keep that in mind. Your teacher isn't Chuck Missler or Chuck Smith or Hal Lindsey or Walter Martin or whoever. Those are all useful resources. But your teacher, especially about something like this, can be none less than the Holy Spirit himself. I am going to suggest that nothing in the Bible is trivial. Everything there is by design. I'm going to suggest that God is his own interpreter. And your most important reference for the book of Revelation are the other 65 books. 
if you can just find your way through them. Now, in this vein, there's a couple of other tools you need to be aware of. And in the interest of time, I won't develop these in, in, in uh, uh, great depth, but I want you to at least be aware of something. Uh, you might turn to Hosea chapter 12, verse 10. Hosea chapter 12, verse 10. And the way you become an instant Bible expert, of course, is to put a tab at the table of contents. And those Bible buffs that know can find the way to Daniel, just turn right one book, you're all there, okay? But anyway, Hosea chapter 12. In Hosea chapter 12, verse 10, God makes an interesting remark that I want us to be sensitive to. He says in verse 10, God says, I have also spoken by the prophets, and I have multiplied visions. Fine so far. Then he says something else. And used similitudes by the ministry of the prophets. Now, the word similitude, for our purposes here, I'm not going to split hairs if there's some English professors here, but I'm going to use the word similitude or simile or model or allegory or a type. For general, our purposes are virtually almost synonyms. There's technical differences between them if you're a student of rhetoric. But the point is, is God uses expressions to get ideas, and they're not just simple words. Sometimes he will use what you and I would call a model. If we build a house that's complicated, especially in three dimensions, we generally will build a model of it to make sure we can visualize the spaces. If you're designing an aircraft wing, you make a mathematical model of the structures, or an oil field, or what have you. If you're designing electronic circuits, you generally have a mathematical model of that circuit before you actually go ahead and start building something. We indulge in our society with what we call models, all kinds. Physical models, mathematical models, all kinds. The bookish term for the same concept is a thing called a type. You make a type or an analogy or a foreshadowing. The Bible has many of these. And you can't talk about these kinds of things without pointing to a couple of major examples. One would be, in Genesis 22, we have this strange story where God tells Abraham to offer his son Isaac in a certain place. And by the time you get to chapter 22, Abraham's learned his lessons. He's pretty sharp. He knows he just does exactly what God wants him to do. And we all know the story where Abraham takes Isaac. He travels three days, takes him up to the top of this hill, and is all prepared to offer him as an offering. Now, if you start analyzing this story, that's got to be a shocker. You mean God uh, endorses child sacrifice? No. This is a very, very unique situation. You all know the story. Just before Abraham actually does the deed, he's interrupted, and they substitute a ram, and they go home, and you know the story. That's called, in the Hebrew terms, the Akedah. It's the Abraham's offering of Isaac. It's a very, very important event in the Bible. Now, what most people don't realize is that Abraham knew he was acting out prophecy. Because he names the place when all this happens. In the Mount of the Lord it shall be seen. He knew it was prophetic. What he may not have realized is that 2,000 years on that exact spot, another father offered his son. And this was all set up as a model, as an anticipation. And the third day issue is there. In fact, we could spend uh, uh, several sessions just studying that one chapter. And the dozens of ways that that chapter specifically, explicitly anticipates the offering of Jesus Christ on the cross. The first place that the word love appears in the Bible is in that chapter. And it should echo John 3.16, where another father wrote you a love letter. A love letter written in blood on a wooden cross, erected 2,000 years ago. Another example of types is the book of Ruth. And I'm going to encourage you, sometime between now and the time we get at chapter 5 of the book of Revelation, I'm going to encourage you to do a little study, or certainly read through, preferably do a little study of the book of Ruth. A little four-chapter book. You can read it very briefly. It's, It's a very elegant little love story. And yet... It turns out to be a profound model of what's really going on in Revelation chapter 5. And I'll defer the details till we get to chapter 5. I encourage you to be sensitive to the fact that God deals with very explicit things. And doctrine should always be built on very explicit things. But God also gives us the benefit of all kinds of models and allegories and perspectives, foreshadowings. Perhaps... The most dramatic one that most people miss is the book of Joshua. Because we have none other than Yehoshua, that's his name, 
which incidentally in the Greek would be Jesus. So we have an Old Testament book that's named after Jesus, strangely enough, in a sense of speaking. And he's a military conqueror. And he takes his people to dispossess the land of the usurpers in God's mind. There were originally ten, three were taken care of, there were seven left. It's interesting that when they go against the, the, of the seven tribes that are left, the strongest one of the Amorites. Their capital was a place called Jericho. We all know the story of Jericho. You don't know who fought the battle of Jericho. You've heard the song. The guy that fought the battle of Jericho is in Joshua chapter 5. You study that carefully, you discover it's none other than Jesus Christ. It's an angel with a sword drawn who claims to be the captain of the Lord's host. And he commands Joshua to worship him. That's not a regular angel. Micah and Gabriel would never do that. There was one angel that asked to be worshipped. He got in a lot of trouble. <laughs> so first of all, none other than Jesus Christ is leading that battle. It's interesting that every law of the Torah is violated in that battle. Ark of the Covenant is not supposed to go to war. It leads the procession. The Levites were exempt from military duty, according to the Torah. They're leading the march. They keep silence while they march around. Once a day for six days. And the seventh day, they march around six times. On the seventh day, they shout, blow their horns, the walls come down, and so forth. you got the seven trumpets thing there. Before Joshua does all this, he sends in two witnesses. What do they get done? They get Rahab saved. That's all they accomplish. The adversaries align themselves under a leader who calls himself the Lord of Righteousness, Adonai Zedek. But he gets defeated in the battle of Beth Horon by signs of the sun and the moon. And the kings that are left over hide in caves and say, rocks fall on us, and so forth. You begin to, the more you study the book of Joshua, and the more you study the book of Revelation, you realize something very interesting. The structure, the, the design of the book of Joshua foreshadows the structure and the design of the book of Revelation. The only thing is they move the decimal point over a little bit. It's not the land, it's the planet Earth we're talking about. And it's not just Israel, it's God's people. In a broader sense. And it's not Joshua. It is Yeshua, Hamashiach, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So the point is, one of the things that will enrich your view of the Revelation and also enrich your view of the Bible is to realize how these things have fingerprints all over them of the Holy Spirit. And you'll even find places that the text has been altered to preserve that relationship. And as we get through the book of Revelation, we'll discover there's all kinds of background that illuminate it. You really need to understand the structure of the tabernacle and how it fits together. You need to understand what the burning bush was really all about and whose voice was really there. But to give you another example, we speak of um, other idioms. In the Bible, the Old Testament, Abraham has a unique title. He's called the friend of God. It's one of the titles. He's uniquely called that. In the New Testament, who is the friend? Who did Jesus call his friends? The disciples. Yes. In the Old Testament... There is a specific guy that's called the beloved prophet, Daniel. He's called the beloved prophet. And, of course, he also has this the apocalyptic book of the Old Testament. In the New Testament, it's interesting, of the disciples, which disciple is called the beloved disciple? John, who wrote the book of Revelation. It's interesting, the concept of friend with Abraham is, is related to Genesis 18, that because he's a friend, God revealed what he's going to do. In the upper room, Jesus says to his disciples, you've been my servants, not from henceforth you are my friends. And he discloses to him the rapture and all those things in chapter 14. John. The extreme form of friend, being beloved, is related to deeper revelation, just as uh, uh, Daniel has, of course, the apocalyptic book of the Old Testament. So, likewise, the beloved disciple, John, has the opportunity to pen the book of Revelation. So it's interesting how you see even the stylistic things of the Holy Spirit consistent. Now, we're going to find out the book of Revelation is rendered into signs. It's signified, rendered into symbols. The Greek word is semeno, which is the word from which we get the word semim. If you're studying in linguistics, you know that's the basic unit of meaning. It means to give a sign, to signify, and so forth, to make known. Now, by the way, that same word in chapter 15 is rendered sign, and chapter 12 is going to be re twice rendered the wonder, and in chapter 19 it's the word of miracle. It's the word that John uses for the word of miracles. So each of these signs is a very, very... Pungent example or idiom. Now, one of the things, let's talk a little bit about preparation. We're going to be indulging in a, a very, very challenging book. I'm going to suggest that you never pick it up without prayer. I'm going to suggest that you petition the Holy Spirit to guide you, illuminate, help you. I'm also going to suggest that we don't charge for this. 
But I'm going to suggest that you better be careful because I'm going to suggest that this study you're going to undertake will be very expensive. Not in terms of dollars, in terms of presuppositions, prejudices, and assumptions you've had about reality. Because you need to recognize this book will probably alter your view about everything. Everything. It will cost you some of your cherished ideas. We'll have a whole list of helps and commentaries and things that will accompany the tapes. But, but the main thing that you have is a Bible and, if anything, a concordance. Now, something else that uh, I'd like you to be aware of is another evidence of design. When you study the Bible, one of the things that's interesting to do is to compare the book of Genesis to the book of Revelation. Genesis is the first book, Revelation the last. It's interesting. In uh, Genesis chapter 1, the earth is created. In Revelation 21, the earth passes away. Everything in the Bible has its beginning in the book of Genesis and has its consummation in the book of Revelation. You can hardly find anything that wasn't started there that isn't finished and vice versa in one book or the other. Again, the sun, moon, and stars show up in chapter 1 and they're taken care of in chapter 4 and chapter 8 in Revelation. The earth's government emerges in Genesis 1 and they're taken care of in chapter 4 and chapter 8 in Revelation. The earth's government emerges in Genesis 37. The earth is judged in uh, Revelation 16. In Genesis, we have the sun to govern the day, and in Revelation, there, uh, there is no need of a sun. Uh, darkness he called night in Genesis chapter 1, and in Revelation says there's no night there. You can take almost every idiom, and you'll find its counterpart in the book of Revelation. Genesis, the waters he called seas, in, in the Revelation says there will be no more seas. In Genesis, we have a river for the earth's blessing, and in Revelation, we have a river for the new earth. Man in Genesis was created in God's image, and in Revelation, man is headed by Satan's image, man on the earth. We have the entrance of sin in the book of Genesis, chapter 3, and we have the end of sin, finally, in Revelation 21 and 22. The curse is pronounced in Genesis, chapter 3, and it is no more curse. In Revelation 22. The entropy laws, I believe, were introduced in Genesis 3, and they're over when we get to Revelation 22. Death entered, of course, in Genesis 3.19, and uh, there is no more death in Revelation 21. The cherubim are first mentioned in Genesis, and they're last mentioned in Revelation 19. Man is driven out of Eden in Genesis 3, verse 24, and he's restored in verse 22. Tree of Life is guarded in chapter 3, verse 24, and the access is restored to him in Revelation 22. Sorrowing and suffering enter in Genesis 3, and there is no more sorrow in Revelation 22. Religion, art, and science have their emergence in Revelation, but separated from God in chapter 4 of Genesis, and they're judged and destroyed in that sense in uh, Revelation 18. Nimrod found a concept called Babylon in Genesis chapter 10. And we're to discover that Babylon falls in Revelation 17 and 18. In fact, you can even look at the Bible as a, in one sense as a story of two cities. We have Babylon introduced in Genesis 10 and the city of Jerusalem introduced when we first encounter Melchizedek in chapter 14. And they become idiomatic, at least, of the city of man and the city of God. And they have their climax in Revelation, where on the one hand, Babylon falls and is destroyed and gets her due. And Jerusalem is replaced, of course, by the new Jerusalem. God's flood to destroy an evil generation, chapter 6 through 9 of Genesis. Satan's flood to destroy the elect generation is attempted in Revelation 12. There was a, a rainbow for God's promise in Genesis 9, and there's a rainbow of remembrance in Revelation, uh, verses chapters 4 and chapter 10. And uh, Sodom and Egypt represent corruption and judgment in uh, Genesis 13 and 19. And we have Sodom and Egypt conceptualized in Jerusalem and when it's ripe for judgment in chapter 11 of, of uh, Revelation. We encounter a confederation against Abram's people in Genesis 14. And we have a confederation against Abraham's seed in uh, Revelation chapter 12. We have a bride for Abram's son in, verse, in Genesis 24 and a bride for Abram's seed in chapter 19 of Re- uh, Revelation. We have a marriage of the first Adam in Genesis 2. We have a marriage of the last Adam in Genesis 19. And we have a promise, the promised seed possesses the gate of his enemies in Genesis 29, and the promised seed possesses in chapter 19. 
Man's dominion ceased and Satan's begun. In Genesis 3, verse 24, and Satan's dominion ends and man's restored in, in Revelation 22. Anyway, just a sampling. You can go on like this, on and on, but you'll discover that there's very visible evidence of design between Genesis and Revelation. And that's preposterous because the Torah was penned thousands of years ago and more, more than a thousand years before Revelation. And, you know, the point is, how could that be? Only by supernatural engineering. And we'll be uh, demonstrating examples of that as we go. Now, one of the things, and again, I'm just trying to indulge in broad survey kinds of things. We'll, we'll get into it verse by verse shortly. But the, uh, something else to be conscious of, you're very, you can't get into the book of Revelation very far without being conscious of the number seven. There are tens of thousands of sevens. I'll list them for you. <laughs> I'll list a few. By the way, the words... The way you decide what numbers mean, by the way, which every ask me, Chuck, what does this, that number, other number mean? Very easy to find out what numbers mean. Look at where they appear and see how they're used. The number seven appears frequently throughout the Bible, not just the book of Revelation. It does not mean divine. A lot of people say, well, seven means divine. Any, anybody who plays craps knows better than that. Um, <laughs> Satan has seven heads. He's certainly not divine. What the number seven seems, by looking at all the places seven appears, you quickly come to the conclusion the number seven is used by the Holy Spirit to mean completeness. Completeness. And indeed, Jesus Christ is complete. Man is incomplete, one less. He's six. Not complete. Therefore, six becomes the number of man. And by extension, the number of sin. But let's get back to seven. We'll discover in chapter one we'll encounter seven churches, seven lampstands, seven spirits, seven stars, seven uh, lamps in another sense, seven title pairs you'll discover, seven promises to the overcomer in chapters two and three, seven seals, seven horns, seven eyes, seven angels, seven trumpets, seven thunders, seven thousand, uh, seven uh, heads, seven crowns, seven plagues, seven bowls, seven mountains, seven kings. Many are even more subtle than that. There are seven features in chapter one we'll look at. There's seven divisions of the seven letters, seven churches. In fact, until you see how they're organized, you won't notice where there's elements missing, which is a clue to what they really mean. We'll get into that. There are seven personages in chapters 12 and 13. There's seven beatitudes scattered throughout the book. There's seven years of judgments. There's seven I am's of Jesus Christ. The Gospel of John, by the way, is organized the same way. In Revelation, we notice it right away because they stare at us. There's seven trumpets and seven bowls and all that. What you don't notice, unless you study it carefully, is the Gospel of John is the same way. It has seven key miracles, which lead to seven key discourses, which include seven I am statements of Jesus Christ. But they're done in a narrative that unless you look for it, you don't notice it. But the same writer, why should we be surprised? Seven doxologies from heaven, seven new things. And whatever list you have, I suspect there's seven times that many sevens. There have been studies done for centuries about the heptatic structure, not just Revelation, of the whole Bible. And it's amazing how not the, the, the overt sevens are pretty obvious, seven years of famine and all those kinds of things. But what's really interesting is how subtly under, in, underneath the text, the mathematical properties of the text itself, sevens are all over the place and uh, the subject of much scholastic uh, study. You're going to also discover that there are signposts. Now, you know, it's interesting, if you study music and study a symphony, you quickly learn that every detail on that page is there for a meaning. The notes, the rest, the, all the, 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 you know, the keys, everything there carries some significance. You'll also discover the same things through the book of Revelation. There's certain words that turn, to be, that turn out to be signposts, flags, triggers. The word metatauta we'll talk about after these things. So it's a key, it occurs four key places, dividing the book in special ways. Four times John says he's in the spirit, and we'll talk about those as we get there. On four different occasions, he speaks of thunders, voices, lightnings, and an earthquake. It's, it, you, you, when you pick up these phrases, you'll pick up, that it's, it's like a signpost, a flag, a milestone. You'll also discover that they're songs, and they come climactically. In, in chapter 1, verse 6, we're going to ha have them sing about glory and dominion. Chapter 4, it becomes glory, honor, and power. Chapter 5, it's blessing, honor, glory, and power. By the time you get to chapter 7, it's blessing, glory, wisdom, thanksgiving, honor, power, and might. But as you watch these things, it doesn't take a lot of insight to realize that somebody's building. You can, feel, you can see the temp, tempo come up. 
Now, something else we're going to encounter as we go through the book, you'll discover wherever God is dealt with here, it's always in three tenses, past, present, and future. God is spoken of as he who, which was, which is, and which is to come. See, past, present, and future. And the same thing, of course, is in Colossians and Gospel of John, Hebrews, and Revelation. We'll take those later. We speak of Jesus Christ with three titles. The faithful witness, past. The first begotten of the dead, present. Prince of the kings of the earth, in terms of his future role. And there's all kinds of, there's references all through the Bible where those are linked, if you will. And it speaks of, unto him who loved us, past. Washed us from our sins in his own blood, present. And made us kings and priests, yet coming, speaking of a redemption. And we're going to discover that the book of Revelation is the only book in the Bible that has a divinely inspired outline. It's organized for you. You don't have to guess. In verse 19 of chapter 1, we're going to encounter the phrase, he's, John is told to write the things which thou hast seen, past, write the things which are, present, and write the things which shall be metatauta, after these things. So again, we've got past, present, future. So we'll constantly see that kind of development. For your homework, what you really ought to do is read the Bible, the whole Bible. <laughs> because you really need to understand in Genesis the role of the Nakash, the shining one, called a serpent later, but he's the Nakash as he appears to Eve. You need to understand who the seed of the woman is, what a kinsman redeemer is. You'll need to understand what the coats of skins were all about, why the blood covering. You understand about the way of the tree of life and the role of the serpent in challenging that and so forth. When you get to Exodus, you want to read about the concept of redemption that occurred when they were delivered, redeemed from Egypt. The deliverance of bondage, the plagues, they're going to all impact. The plagues will show up in the book of Revelation. The burning bush, the thorns, the thorn bush of the desert and why it wasn't consumed. What drew Moses wasn't God's righteousness, it was his grace. Here's a a symbol of sin that's not being consumed. It's a model of grace. And the voice of the burning bush, Jesus tells him, was, it says in, in John chapter 8, is his voice. And on it goes. Yeah, I'm being sort of facetious here, but I want to give you respect for what we're going to try to touch on as we go. You'll need to know the Levitical feasts, their offerings in the Levitical calendar. You'll need to understand from the book of Numbers how the camp of Israel was laid out. It's going to be important to understand the book. And, of course, I've touched a little bit about... Uh, the book of Joshua, how critical it is. You won't understand the title of real estate the way they dealt with it unless you know the book of Ruth and what a redemption is and what the Goel, the kinsman redeemer, is. We'll need that for chapter 5. We need to understand what David did to the priest, dividing up into 24 courses, or you'll never understand what the 24 elders are all about. We need to understand the peculiar role of Elijah, because he's going to be a major player in the book of Revelation. And on it goes. So, obviously, we can't, I'm just half kidding, if somehow you could... You really master the Bible between now and our next meeting it would be helpful. <laughs> but, relax, what we will hope to do is touch upon these things and give you pointers so that you can uh, find your way uh, through these things at, at, at your leisure. By the way, there's also seven songs, but I'll leave that out for right now. The book of Revelation is about four things that are out of place. Four things that are out of place. Israel is supposed to be in the land. The church is supposed to be in heaven. It ain't yet. The Lamb of God is to be on his own throne. He ain't yet. He will be. Satan is supposed to be bound. Now, some people run around saying that we're already in the millennium. I love the way Chuck Smith deals with that one. He says, if that's the case, his chain is too long. (laughs) Book of Revelation is about three women, idiomatically speaking. One is the wife of Yahweh, or Jehovah, or however you want to say it. That's the woman of Revelation 12. Then there's the virgin bride of Christ, the church. And then, of course, there's the harlot that rides the scarlet beast. And we'll talk, of course, about all of these, and I'm sure we'll have something to offend everyone in that discussion. There are some things that I'm going to try to deal with as we go through, but if you have the opportunity, now I'm a little more serious, to do a little homework. You don't have to do it by next time, but as you, as you find this gathering challenging, uh, I would encourage you to t- undertake a couple of special studies if you can. One of the things that you'll quickly discover is the key to understanding the Bible in a prophetic sense 
is to understand the last four verses of Daniel chapter 9. There's a passage called the 70 weeks of Daniel. If you get a chance or have some resources to do some background on the 70 weeks of Daniel, you'll find it enormously useful. But in any case, we, of course, will be trying to cover that in the time we have when we get there. There's another issue that is probably one of the most important issues before the body of Christ today. I should say it still remains today. It shouldn't be an issue anymore. And that's the distinction between Israel and the church. There are many backgrounds, many groups that tend, for a variety of reasons, either inadvertently or some quite overtly, to try to make, that end up making those two things confused. Israel had its birth in Exodus, the deliverance of Exodus. Israel is a nation. It has a destiny. Throughout the Old and New Testament, that destiny is confirmed. It has a prophetic destiny, the nation Israel. Nation Israel, Israel is mentioned 75 times in the New Testament. Each place it is literal national Israel. There's one verse that some people argue about, but that's because they don't understand the Greek. But I won't get to that here. The point is, Israel is unique. It has a unique origin, a unique mission, and a unique destiny. The Bible te- deals with that throughout the Bible, but Revelation will bring that into focus. The church has its birthday on Pentecost. The uh, church could not exist until after the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Jesus makes that very clear in the Upper Room Discourse. He had to leave before the Holy Spirit could come. The church has a birth at Pentecost. It has a terminus, the rapture. And Paul mentions that very clearly, that, that, that uh, Israel is set aside or blinded until the fullness of the Gentiles become in. There's a, clearly, they're mutually exclusive. The 70 weeks of Daniel make that also very clear. And the church is a mystery revealed in the New Testament, but you can find it in the Old if you know how to look. It's always there in the sense of a, of a occultation, and we'll show you some of that. But the book of Revelation will bring this issue to the fore. It will allow us con- nothing but confusion unless we discriminate between the church and Israel. They're different. They have different destinies, very uniquely different destinies. So I'm not asking you to buy that. I want you to just be sensitive to that issue. And I want you to be prepared to deal with that issue in your own studies and to recognize that that distinctiveness is very, very important. And you're going to be shocked when you find out how Jesus speaks of those who confuse the two. We're also going to discover something else that may surprise many, and that is that there's different categories of saints. Not everybody that's a saint or elect is in the same category. That may sound shocking. And I've got a couple minutes. Let me just sneak in a quick example of what I'm talking about. Jesus said of John the Baptist, no man born of woman is greater than John. Boy, that's quite an accolade, right? In his next breath, he says, he that's least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than John. What does that mean? Does that mean John wasn't saved? No. One of the clues comes from Luke 16, 16. We tend to think that the Old Testament concluded with the book of Malachi. Certainly, that's the last book of the Old Testament, as we reckon the, uh, the Tanakh, the Old Testament. But Luke 16:16 16, 16 says that the law and the prophets, that is the Old Testament as we think of it, were until John. John the Baptist is the last of the Old Testament. And that's the point that Jesus is making. There's something new that he's introducing. Now you also will discover that Jesus proclaims in Matthew 16, speaking of the church, that the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Right? They'll not be overcome. In the book of Daniel and in the book of Revelation, we'll discover that the Antichrist is going to prevail, same word, over the uh, saints at that time. Sounds like a contradiction. No, it's a contradiction only if you assume that all saints are in the church. It's, in fact, an illumination of the fact that there's a category of saints that are different. And you'll find scholars talk about the Old Testament saints. We know a lot about what that all means. They speak of the church as a special category. We know a lot about what that's all about because of Paul's epistles plus other things. But there's also a category of believers, of saints, elect people that are saved in the book of Revelation that are post-church, whatever that means. And we'll get into that. Some of those issues are going to surface here. So just be alert to the fact that when it says saint or elect, you need to look at context and a little background to see where that all fits together. Now, we've got a few minutes left. Let's turn to Revelation chapter 1, verse 1. 
And so if nothing else, you can tell your friends, Chuck took all night for one verse. <laughs> Revelation chapter 1, verse 1. First sentence is probably one of the most staggering in the entire book. Nobody reads the first sentence carefully enough. The apocalypse, the revelation, the revelation singular of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him. Well, wait a minute. Let's stop right there. God gave this to whom? Him is a pronoun. What's the antecedent? Jesus Christ. I've got a question for you to think about this week. Can Jesus learn? Well, I don't know. See, we always say there's three things God can't do, right? He cannot lie. Tanakh says eight times the, the eternal one cannot lie, right? Second thing he can't do, right, is he can't learn. He knows everything. I thought God knew everything, right? That's always encouraging, because if he knows everything, he can't be disappointed in you. He knows what a speckled person you really will be next week. Not just Pat. You're coming, coming up, you know. When you fall flat on your face, you may be surprised. God didn't. That's why he had to die. And say, well, what's the third thing he can't do? He can't make you love him. That has to be an act of your own volition. But here's an interesting issue. See, we know that the child Jesus grew in knowledge. All these stories about childhood miracles are unscriptural. Because the scripture tells us that he grew. Now, most scholars recognize that, the, that he came into a broad awareness of his mission and destiny at the baptism. The baptism of Jesus Christ is a big deal, bigger than most of us realize when we read that part of the, 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 uh, the Gospels. But there's a strange remark that Jesus makes in Mark chapter 13. He's speaking of the famous thing, no man knows the day nor the hour. You've all heard that. It's recorded several places. In the Mark account, it's very strange. Verse 32, I believe it is. He says, no, Jesus says, no man knows the day nor the hour, not the angels in heaven, not the Son, but the Father only. Boy, that's a troublesome verse. Whatever else that means, it also implies, there's some, at least at that moment, some things that the Father knew the Son didn't. That's difficult for us to get our minds around. It raises some very pro- provocative issues. Now, it would seem, then, that there are issues that were revealed to him when the time came. And it would seem suggestive, at least, that that's part of what Revelation is all about. The revelation of the unveiling of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him. Unto whom? Unto Jesus Christ. Boy, if this language seems a little lofty, it's no surprise it's the Father talking to the Son, in a sense. Revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him to show unto his servants... Now, the word there is doulos, by the way. It's an exciting word. The word doulos. It's a term that the apostles used of themselves in a number of places. The concept in Israel was that if you were indentured as a servant for seven years, typically, you served that to pay off a debt or whatever. At the end of the seven years, you had a choice. You could elect to go free, Or, as some did, you could choose to stay with the house that you're serving forever, for the rest of your days. If you chose to do that, you then were indentured to that house for the rest of your days. And the way they memorialized that is they went to the doorpost of the house and they pierced your ear to the doorpost. In other words, binding you to the house is the concept. And then what what they did from that point on, the, the servant would typically wear a ring in his ear. And that was a badge of honor. Because other people visiting the household would know that he was an indentured servant. He was something, somebody that had chosen of his own to serve that house for the rest of his days. He was a doulos, not just a, you know, a bond servant. I mean, a regular servant. He was a bond, what's called a bond servant. Now, it's interesting, in the Bible, that only the word all, like an like a ice pick and all, it appears only twice. In each case it appears, it has to do with the doulos. But anyway... The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him to show unto his bond slaves things which must shortly come to pass. The word shortly, by the way, is actually in text and the Greek. It's not shortly like a short duration of time. It's more like RPM on an engine. It's a Greek word from which tachometer, we get the word tachometer from. It means quickly. In other words, once these things start, they're going to happen very quickly. That's really what the word means. And taxi in the Greek. 
Things just must quickly come to pass. And he sent and signified it, signified it, made it into signs, symbols, and sent it by his angelos unto his servant John. And it goes on. A lot of discussion about the, what the word angel means. And some people believe, some scholars believe, the word angel simply means messenger. If I'm a, I was a Greek commander and I had weakness on my right flank and I wanted to send a message to the you know, platoon commander on my right flank, I would send an angel, an angelos, to the right flank. It was a messenger is what the word means. Now, frequently, but not always in the Bible, it means a supernatural messenger from the throne of God. In many places in the Bible, the word is also used of just a messenger. And so some, some scholars believe that what he's referring to here is we're going to discover this, seven, this thing is going to be covered with seven cover letters to seven churches and given to the angelos of those seven churches. Some people believe that's simply the pastor of those churches. And others, and I think the majority of conservative scholars, believe what's implied here is that there is an actual angel in charge of each of those churches. We do know from Matthew 18 the concept of guardian angels for our children is scriptural. Jesus makes reference to them. And I think most of us, uh, uh, probably, I know there's a m- number of us in the audience here that uh, their angels w- uh, get overtime credit. You know, uh, The fact that there may be an angel for each fellowship is broadly held, and that's one of the views. But that's a beginning of the book of Revelation. So I'm going to uh, let that be it for tonight. From now on, we'll be going roughly about a chapter a night. I encourage you to hold the study up in prayer. If you do get a chance, if you do nothing else between now and our next meeting, I do encourage you to read many times, not just once, read chapter 1. Read chapter 1 as carefully, as repeatedly, as often as your occasion allows between now and our next meeting. And we'll just plunge in and learn not only a lot about chapter 1, but we'll also begin to illuminate the kind of methodology you can use to unlock the secrets, the treasures, the hidden things that God has put here for our learning. Let's stand for a closing word of prayer. Let's bow our hearts. Father, we just praise you for this time together. We thank you, Father, for the revelation you've given us of Jesus Christ. And, Father, you've promised that if we would ask for the Holy Spirit that we would receive it. So, Father, we would just pray that you would, through your Holy Spirit, increase in us, each of us, a renewed appetite, a hunger for your word. We pray, Father, that you would take this opportunity to refresh each of us in a renewed understanding of the extremes that you've gone to that we might live. And further, Father, we pray that you would appropriate these insights, these words, these treasures to our lives, that we might not be hearers only, but doers, that you would accomplish your purpose in each of our lives. For we commit this before your throne as you've instructed us. We commit it before you in the name of Yeshua HaMashiach, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ.